Hi everyone, this is Pastor Laura, and welcome to Bible Boot Camp, where we dive into a different book of scripture each week. Uh, this week we're looking at the book of Job, and this is probably going to be the last video for a while. Um, but the book of Job, um, right after the book of Esther, uh, book of Job is uh, really hard to date. So there's no reference to kings, there's no reference to historical events, um, there's no sort of um, framework within the book that we can use to um, to figure out when this is supposed to take place or when it was written. Um, so most scholars would say that it was probably written sometime between the 600s and the 400s BCE. Um, so the middle, middle of that range would be the start of the Persian era. So the time period just before Nehemiah and Ezra and Esther take place. Um, so there's no sign that... Um, Again, there's no sign that this is meant to be a recounting of a historical person named Job. It's more likely that it's a reflection on um, how do we understand God? How do we understand human conduct? How do we understand human suffering? Um, which doesn't make it any less valuable, uh, makes it incredibly valuable that this is people working through their theology um, in conversation with God about how to understand their lives. Uh, so the book of Job is part of the wisdom tradition. So we're kind of in a different genre now than we were with Esther and all the books before. Um, so this is the books of Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. A lot of the Psalms are also in this tradition of wisdom. Um, sometimes the book of Song of Songs is also included in that group of wisdom literature. Um, and even though these books can be very different, um, each of them has a lot of poetry. That's one thing they share in common. Um, and each one deals with this question of how do we relate to God and conduct our lives? And how does our conduct, how does um, our morality, how does how we behave, how does that relate to our well-being, what does God do with our behavior. Um, and it's really interesting because um, each of these books kind of brings out a different aspect of wisdom. Um, and really, we need each one of those books to have a full understanding of what wisdom is according to God. Um, so, for example, like Proverbs is mostly focused on this idea that um, that wisdom means that, um, you know, good, righteous conduct, conduct leads to a good and fruitful life and poor conduct, conduct and moral conduct leads to um leads to hardship in life. So that's kind of one of the themes of Proverbs, that kind of you, you get um, what you give. Um, and that's true in a lot of ways in life. Um, that's not false at all. That is definitely, there's definitely a lot of truth to that. Um, but in some ways, that's not always true. And scripture recognizes that. Um, and that's where the book of Job comes in. And Ecclesiastes kind of uh, broadening that understanding of wisdom that yes, your conduct can bring you, um, you know, if you, if you conduct yourself in the way God would like you to, you can receive great blessings. That is the way to find wholeness in life. It's the way to find peace. Um, and yet at the same time, suffering happens and suffering happens even to really, really good people. Um, and, and, that's part of scripture too. So again, it's this multifaceted understanding of what wisdom is um, and how our lives um, work. So again, Job kind of upends that idea that a really righteous person is going to live a perfect life. Uh, so Job is righteous, but he also has these very unbearable trials happen to him. Um, and so wisdom in the book of Job is understanding that um, you know, God isn't just about blessing and punishment based on our behavior. Um, God is totally free. God is not constrained by our behavior. Um, and that kind of gets into the understanding of grace, too. Um, you know, God, we can't control God by being good or by being bad. Um, and God is free to offer blessings to anyone. God is free to offer grace to anyone. Um and so human suffering is not always the result of bad behavior. Um, human thriving isn't always the result of good behavior. Um, also, part of this book of Job is, um, is this idea that humans are not the, the sole point of creation, that we're just part of creation. Um, creation is always going to defy our explanations, our categories, um, that 
Um, there is so much more to God's order in the world than we could ever hope to understand. Um, that God is so much bigger than than our comprehension. Um, and in a way, um, that kind of wisdom, understanding God's um, bigness, that can bring comfort in a way that um, that there's more to the world, there's more to life than just me. Um, and my understanding has limits. Um, the other part of this book is um, this idea that, you know, in all of our suffering, humans can keep engaging with God in dialogue. We can argue with God, we can question God, we can be angry and confused with God, and God will still honor that relationship. Um, so each of Job's friends um, offers reasons for his suffering. There's kind of like three cycles of dialogue between Job and his friends. Um, and each of their responses has some wisdom in it. Um, but God ultimately defends Job. Um, some of his friends are seeking kind of simplistic answers. You know, well, you must have done something wrong. That's why you're suffering. Um, and God kind of blows that out of the water. Um, so Job's friends also kind of try to get Job to turn inward, to examine himself, um, to find out why he's suffering. Um, but Job kind of resists that. Instead of examining himself to see what he's done wrong, um, Job turns to God. Um, and in this book, we learn that even turning to God in anger is still turning to God. And God honors that. And God responds to Job. Uh, Job is a book that switches between prose and poetry. So again, these wisdom books have a lot of poetry in them. Um, this is a very, very sophisticated poetry in this book. There's a lot of words that only pop up uh, once or twice in scripture. So a lot of rare words. Um, it's got some complex ideas, some complex grammar. So it's written by an author who's very highly educated, who knows um, Hebrew literature, who's familiar with law, um, all of that stuff. Um, I remember in Hebrew class in seminary, uh, we had to choose a passage from the Old Testament, so anywhere in the Old Testament, uh, to translate for our final project. And so I chose a passage from Job, and my teacher warned me that that was going to be kind of hard because the poetry is, um, again, it's very sophisticated, um, and it was pretty hard. Um, so just some characteristics of Hebrew poetry that's true throughout Scripture. Um, Hebrew poetry is very um, what they call terse, so it uses not so many words to say a lot. It leaves out unnecessary words. It kind of leaves ambiguity, so um, so you can read a lot into each word that's given. Um, so there's a lot of room for the reader in there to kind of um, to engage with it. It's not going to just tell you everything all at once. Um, it uses a lot of parallelism, so repeated. Um, content or grammatical structure in adjacent lines. So um, an example of that is Psalm 117, verse 1. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. So it's saying the same thing twice, just with different words or slightly, slightly, just saying it slightly differently. There's a lot of repetition in Hebrew poetry. Um, there's a couple of patterns to look for. Um, inclusio is like a frame. So a passage or a poem begins and ends with the same word or phrase or idea. Um, or a chiasm, which is kind of reverse repetition. So there's um, one idea or word or phrase, and then there's um, like two similar ones in the middle. And then that first word or phrase or idea comes back at the end. So like A, B, B, A, or A, B, B, C. A, B, C, B, A, kind of like a going inward and back outward. Um, there's a lot of play on words and sounds. Um, that's true of Hebrew prose and poetry. And there's a lot of metaphor and simile. Um, so again, the book of Job has a pretty clear structure. There's sort of a prologue um, with this dialogue with Satan. Again, Satan doesn't pop up a whole lot in the Old Testament. And this is one of the places where... Um, where he does. Um, and there's some dialogues with friends. Um, again, like kind of three rounds of dialogues where Job talks to his friends or they come to talk with him about what's going on. Um, Job has this final response to them uh, in 
uh, chapter 26, um, starting there. Um, then there's one more friend who comes in, gives a speech. Um, and then at the end, God comes in and kind of reveals God's self to Job. Um, and Job responds to that. And then that's kind of the end. Uh, so that's the book of Job. I'm not going to go through it in depth, but that's just kind of some background to it um, for you to read it for yourself. Um, one passage that I really like, and this is the passage I translated in Hebrew class, um, chapter 38. I just love this um, this part where God reveals God's self to Job. Um, we just get this sense of like, wow, like God is close because God hears Job. God listens to Job. God cares about Job. Um Job is an individual. God cares about Job. And, you know, it's an individual is not beyond God's notice. Um, but also the sense of like, um, wow, it, like there's so much more to God than I could comprehend. So chapter 38. Uh, then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. God said, who is this that obscures my plans with knowledge, with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? And what were its footlings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped in it in, it in thick darkness? When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place, that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light and their upraised arm is broken. So that's just good, you know, if you're going to read, um, this is a, just a good book to read through um, all together. But if you just want something to um, to contemplate, if you are looking for material to pray about or even to illustrate, if you want to try some drawing prayer, um, this is a great passage to do that with. Um, just to sit with it, sit with the poetry of it. Um, just sit with the like the sort of beyond our understanding meaning of it um, and kind of one of those things where you don't ponder it out intellectually necessarily, but you have an emotional reaction to it and um, just kind of sit with how big God is. Um, that's a good passage to do that with. So that's the book of Job. Thank you for listening to Bible Boot Camp. We may return in the fall. We shall see. Um, but I hope that this has been helpful and I have really enjoyed doing it and I have learned a lot myself. So thank you for watching.